Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. So, let me take this just for a minute. I was just. Okay, let's leave that open. I have to get a little bit of water. Okay. So what we were doing before when we were when we were starting with the different kinds of people, we were starting by going into uh, I think we went as far as Sariputta and Mogalana. I think that's where we left off. Yeah? Is yes. that right? Yes. Okay. And so the next part of this is when you're interested in who is in the texts and you're interested in who talking about the characters, the next person uh, that is in the book is about the Buddha and his relatives. And this is actually a really neat section. And one of the first sections anybody told me about. And I had just learned about Buddhism. And um, I uh, took uh, seven monks from Washington, D.C. into the mountains, the Blue Ridge Mountains, to a place called Red Oak Canyon. And they were sitting by a waterfall and then we had to hike back out my uncle and myself and these seven monks and when um, we were hiking out i was walking back with um panyaloka bhanti panyaloka is from nepal and he is an advanced meditator and he is <clears throat> he's a historian and a very good storyteller so this is a long hike out. I don't know, maybe when I say long, it's about three, four miles out. So we're, we were walking along and he just decided to tell me what happened to everybody. And, um, and it gets really fun to listen to some of this. So I'll start reading about it and you can, we'll go through them one by one. But King Siddhadana, first desires to see the Buddha. And this is uh, the point to remember is service to the relatives is a blessing. This comes from the Mangala Sutta. And so King Suddhodana, he, he was the father of the Buddha and news that the Buddha was residing at Rajagaha and was preaching his Dhamma, reached the ears of the aged king, Suddhodana, and his anxiety to see his enlightened son, it grew stronger and stronger. On nine successive occasions, he sent nine couriers, each one with a large following, to invite the Buddha to come back to Kapalavatu which is where he grew up. Contrary to his expectations, they all heard the Dhamma and attaining arahatship, they entered the order, they did not return. And since arahants were indifferent to worldly things, they did not convey the message to the Buddha from his father. Now, the disappointed king finally dispatched another faithful courtier, courtier Kaludai, who was a playmate of the Buddha as he was growing up. And he agreed to go as 
he was granted permission to enter the, the order. Like the rest, he also had the fortune to attain arahantship and join the order. But unlike the others, he conveyed the message to the Buddha and persuaded him to visit his aged royal father. And as the season was most suitable for traveling, the Buddha attended by a large retinue of his disciples journeyed the whole distance by slow stages, preaching the Dhamma along the way. And in due course, he arrived at Kapilavatu in two months time. Arrangements were made for him to reside at the park of Nigroda, Asakya. The conceited elderly Sakyas, thinking within themselves, he is the younger brother, our nephew, our grandson, said to the young princes, you do him obeisance, we will sit behind you. As they sat without paying him due reverence, he subdued them their pride by rising into the air and exhibiting the twin wonder. The king, seeing this wonderful phenomenon, saluted him immediately and saying that it was his third salutation. All Sakyas were then compelled to pay him due reverence. And thereupon the Buddha came down from the sky sat on the seat prepared for him. The humbled relatives took their seats eager to listen to his teaching. So what was it that happened? What was the twin wonder? The Yamaka Patiharya, often translated as the twin miracle, is a psychic phenomena which only a Buddha could perform. And by his psychic powers, he makes fire and water issue from the pores of the body simultaneously. Patisambhidamaga commentary states that by fire and water are meant red and blue rays came out of him. And then what happened was the Sakya saluted him for the first time when he saw the infant prince's feet rest on the head of the ascetic Asita, whom he wanted to, he wanted the child to revere. And his second salutation took place at the plowing festival when he saw the infant prince seated cross-legged on the couch absorbed in meditation. Must have had a, a, a cross a, a couch sitting under the rose apple tree. All this time, I thought he was sitting on the ground. So this in this account, he's sitting on a couch that's placed under the rose apple tree, most likely. Okay. So at this moment, an unexpected shower of rain fell upon the Sakya kinfolk the occurrence of the strange phenomena resulted in a discussion amongst themselves. And then the Buddha preached the Vesantara Jataka to show that a similar incident took place in the presence of his relatives in a previous birth. Now, if we go to the Jataka tale, which I don't have with me here, but the, um, the interesting story they're talking about, it's the longest in the Jataka commentary and illustrates uh, his unrivaled generosity. The Sakyas were delighted with the discourse. 
They then departed, not knowing that it was their duty to invite the Buddha and his disciples for the noon meal. It did not occur to the king too to invite the Buddha, although he thought to himself, if my son does not come to my house, where will he go? Reaching home, he, however, made ready several kinds of food, expecting their arrival in the palace. Now the Buddha, he goes on a round for alms. And now we hear also about King Suddhodana's conversion. As there was no special invitation for the noon meal on the following day, the Buddha and his disciples got ready to seek alms from the houses of the citizens of Kapalavatu. Before proceeding, he considered within himself, did the Buddhas of the past, upon entering the city of their kinsfolk, straightway enter the houses of the relatives? Or did they go from house to house in regular order receiving alms. Perceiving that they did so from house to house, the Buddha went in the streets of Kapalavatu seeking alms. And on hearing of this seemingly disgraceful conduct of the Buddha from his daughter-in-law, Yasodhara, the king, greatly perturbed in his mind, hurried to the scene and saluting him said, son, why do you ruin me? I am overwhelmed with shame to see you begging alms. Is it proper for you who used to travel in a golden palanquin to seek alms in this very city? Why do you put me to shame, he said. I am not putting you to shame, O great king. I am following the custom of my lineage, replied the Buddha to the king's astonishment. But dear son, is it the custom of my lineage to gain a livelihood by seeking alms? Surely, Lord, ours is the warrior lineage of Mahasamada, and not a single warrior has gone out seeking alms. O oh, great king, that is not the custom of your royal lineage, but it is the custom of my Buddha lineage. Several thousands of Buddhas have lived by seeking alms. Be not heedless in standing at the doors for alms, his father said. Lead a righteous life, the righteous live happily both in the world and in the next. Hearing it, the king realized the truth and attained the first stage of his sainthood. Immediately after, he took the Buddha's bowl and conducting him and his disciples to the palace, he served them with choice food. At the close of the meal, the Buddha again exhorted him thus, lead a righteous life and not one that is corrupt. The righteous live happily, both in this world and in the next. Thereupon the king attained the second stage of sainthood, Sakatagami, and Panjapati Godami attained the first stage of sainthood, Sotapata. On a later occasion, when it was related to the Buddha that the king refused to believe that his son had died owing to his severe austerities without achieving his goal, the Buddha preached the Dhammapala Jataka to show that in a previous birth, too, he refused to believe that his son had died, although he was shown a heap of bones. And this time, he attained the third stage of sainthood. So now his father is an onagami.
And then on his deathbed, the king heard the Dhamma from the Buddha for the last time and attained arahatship. After experiencing the bliss of emancipation for seven days, he passed away as a lay arahant when the Buddha was about 40 years old. Now comes the story of the Buddha and Yasodhara. Princess Yasodhara, also known as Rahula Mata, Imba, and Buddha Kachana, was the daughter of King Supabuddha, who reigned over the Kaliya race, and Pamita, sister of the King Suddhodana. She was the same age as Princess Prince Siddhartha, sorry, whom she married at the age of 16. Now, it was by exhibiting his military prowess that he won her hand. She led an extremely happy and luxurious life. But then in her 29th year, on the very day that she gave birth to her only son, Rahula, her wise and contemplative husband, whom she loved with all her heart, resolved to renounce the world, to seek deliverance from the ills of life. Without even bidding farewell to his faithful and charming wife, he left the palace at night, leaving young Yasodhara to look after the child by herself. Now, I want to point out that this is not exactly accurate, okay? First of all, we have evidence that he must have said goodbye and asked permission from his father to go and not just simply leave. It doesn't make any sense that an account would be written by this in this way. The second part of it is that um, when we say that Yasodhara was left alone after the child, but to watch after the child by herself, it's kind of an absurd statement because he lived in a palace, in a palace complex with aunts and uncles and all kinds of people around him. And it was like a multiple parents parenting situation. So to write books today about how he abandoned his wife and such like that, and his son is not exactly accurate when you put a cultural definition on what actually happened here. She awoke as usual to greet her beloved husband, but to her surprise, she found him missing. And when she realized that her ideal prince had left her and the newborn babe, she was overcome with indescribable grief. It's true, at first she was. She, her dearest possession was lost forever. The palace with all its allurements was now just a dungeon to her. The whole world appeared to be blank and her only consolation was her infant son. Through several Kshatriya princes sought her afterwards. And although that occurred, she rejected all those proposals and lived ever faithful to her beloved husband. Hearing that her husband was leading a hermit's life, she removed all her jewelry and wore a plain yellow garb as well. Throughout the six years during which the ascetic Gotama struggled for enlightenment, Princess Yasodhara watched his actions closely and did likewise. She had an internal connection with him, could feel what was happening and chose to parallel what was going on for him emotionally as he was going through all this. And when the Buddha visited Kapalavatu after his enlightenment and was being entertained by the king in the palace on the following day, all but the princess Yasodhara came to pay their reverence to him. She thought, certainly if there is any virtue in me, the noble Lord himself will come to my presence and then will I reverence him. She had no idea about the arahatship, no idea of what had occurred. After the meal was over, 
the Buddha handed over the bowl to the king. And accompanied by his two chief disciples, he entered the chamber of Yasodra and sat on a seat prepared for him, saying, let the king's daughter reverence me as she likes and say nothing. Here, hearing of the Buddha's visit, she begged that her ladies in the court wear yellow garments. And when the Buddha took his seat, Yasodra came swiftly to him and clasping his ankles, placed her head on his feet and reverenced him as she liked. Demonstrating her affection and respect, thus in this way, she sat down with due reverence. And then the king praised her virtues and commenting on her love and loyalty said, Lord, when my daughter heard that you were wearing yellow robes, she also robed herself in yellow. And when she heard that you were taking one meal a day, she also did the same. And when she heard that you had given up lofty couches, she gave to lay on a low couch only. And when she heard that you had given up garlands and scents, she also gave them up. And when her relatives sent messages to say that they would maintain her, she did not even look at a single one. So virtuous was my daughter. Not only in this last birth, O King, but in a previous birth too, she protected me and was devoted and faithful to me, remarked the Buddha. And he cited the Chan Dakinara Jataka. It's in volume four of the Jataka Tales. It's number 485. Recalling this past association with her, she consoled and left the palace. Now, after the death of King Sudana, when Hajapati Godami became a nun, a bhikkhuni, Yasudra also entered the order and she attained arahantship. Amongst women disciples, she was the chief of those who attained great supernormal powers. It's called the Maha Abhinai, the powers, the supernormal powers. And at the age of 78, she passed away. Her name does not appear in the Taragata the account of the nuns and their sayings when they were first became Arahat. But her interesting verses are found in the Apadana. Let's see if we can find this for you. Oh, what number is that? In the Apadana too, okay. Here she relates her association with the Bodhisattva when he met the Buddha, Dipankara, and resolved to become a Buddha. They were related at that time in another lifetime before she was with Siddhartha. Now comes the Buddha and Rahula. Rahula was the only son of Prince Siddhartha and Princess Yasodra. He was born on the day when Prince Siddhartha decided to renounce the world. The happy news of the birth of his infant son was conveyed to him when he was in the park in a contemplative mood. He was meditating. Contrary to ordinary expectations, instead of rejoicing over the news, he proclaimed Rahu Jatu, Pandaham Jatam. A Rahu is born, a fetter has arisen. Accordingly, the child was named Rahula by King Siddhodana, his grandfather. 
Rahula was brought up as a fatherless child by his mother and grandfather. And actually it was by his aunt because his mother passed away when he was born. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, got mixed up. That was the Buddha, sorry. Rahula was brought up as a fatherless child by his mother and grandfather. When he was seven years old, the Buddha visited Kapalavatu for the first time after his enlightenment. And on the seventh day after his arrival, Princess Yasodhara, gaily dressed up young Rahula, pointed to the Buddha and said, Behold, my son, that golden colored ascetic, looking like Brahma, surrounded by 20,000 ascetics, he is your father, and he had great treasures. Since his renunciation, we do not see them. Go up to him and ask for your inheritance and say, Father, I am the prince. After my consecration, I will be a universal monarch. I am in need of wealth. Please give me wealth, for the son is the owner of what belongs to the father. So this was his plea to his father. Innocent, Rahula came to the Buddha's presence and asked him for his inheritance as advised by his mother. He very affectionately said, O oh, ascetic, even your shadow is pleasing to me. Now, after the meal, the Buddha left the palace and Rahula followed him. He was saying, give me my inheritance and uttering much else that was becoming to his father. Nobody attempted to stop him, nor did the Buddha prevent him from following him. Reaching the park, the Buddha thought, he desires his father's wealth, but it goes with the world and is full of trouble. I shall give him the sevenfold noble wealth, which I received at the foot of the Bodhi tree and make him an owner of the transcendental inheritance. He called Venerable Sariputta and asked him to ordain little Rahula. Rahula, who was then only seven years of age, was admitted to the holy order. And his shrine is still there, marking the spot where he was ordained by Sariputta. It looks basically like a London telephone booth with an Asian formed top on the top of it. It's kind of sweet, it's very small and it's on top of a mound. It's really nice. King Sidodina was deeply grieved by hearing of the unexpected ordination of his beloved grandson. He approached the Buddha and in humbly requesting him not to ordain anyone without the prior consent of the parents. He said, when the Lord renounced the world, it was a cause of great pain to me. It was so when Nanda renounced, that was his cousin, and especially so in the case of Rahula. And Nanda, by the way, he left on the day he was supposed to meet his wife to be married. So it makes it an even more interesting story. The love of a father towards a son cuts through the skin, the hide, the flesh, the sinew, the bone, and the marrow. Grant, Lord, the request that the noble ones may not confer ordination on a son without the permission of his parents. The Buddha readily granted this request and made it into a Vinaya rule. How a young boy of seven years could lead the holy life is almost inconceivable, but some, 
Samanera, novice, Rahula, cultured, exceptionally obedient and well-disciplined as he was, was very eager to accept instruction from his superiors. It is stated that he would rise early in the morning and take a handful of sand, throw it up, saying, today may I receive from my instructors as much counsel as these grains of sand. He was eager to learn. At seven, one of the earliest discourses preached to him immediately after his ordination was the Ambalatika Rahulavada Sutta. I believe that is 61. I might be wrong, but I think it's 61 in the Majjhima Nikaya, in which he emphasized the importance of truthfulness. That's what was emphasized to him by his father. One day, the Buddha visited the venerable Rahula, who, seeing him coming from afar, arranged a seat and supplied water for washing the feet. The Buddha washed his feet, and leaving a small quantity of water in the vessel, he said, Do you see, Rahula, this small quantity of water left in this vessel? Yes, Lord. Similarly, Rahula, insignificant, Indeed, is the samana ship or monkhood of those who are not ashamed of uttering a deliberate lie. And then the Buddha threw away the small quantity of water and said, discarded indeed is the samana ship of those who are not ashamed of deliberate lying. The Buddha turned the vessel upside down and he said, Overturned indeed is the samana ship of anyone who is not ashamed of uttering deliberate lies. Finally, the Buddha set the vessel upright and said, Empty and void indeed is the samana ship of those who are not ashamed of deliberate lying. I say to anyone who is not ashamed of uttering deliberate lies, that there is no evil that could not be done to him or by him. Accordingly, Rahula, thus should you train yourself. Not even in play will I tell a lie. And emphasizing the importance of truthfulness with such homely illustrations, the Buddha explained to him the value of reflection and the criterion of morality in such a way as a child could simply understand. Rahula, for what purpose is a mirror, he said, questioned the Buddha. For the purpose of reflecting, Lord. Similarly, Rahula, after reflecting, and reflecting, should bodily action be done? After reflecting, should verbal action be done? After reflecting, should mental action be done? Whatever action you desire to do with the body, of that particular bodily action, you should first reflect. Now, this action that I desire to perform with the body, would this my bodily action be conducive to my own harm or to the harm of others or to that of both myself and others. Then unskillfully is this bodily action to take place entailing suffering and probably producing pain. If when reflecting, you should realize now this bodily action of mine that I am desirous of performing would be conducive to my own harm and to the harm of others and to that of both myself and others, then unskillful is this bodily action entailing suffering and producing pain. Such an action with the body you must on no account perform. 
Now, if on the other hand, when reflecting, you realize now this body bodily action that I am desirous of performing would conduce neither to harm myself or others or both myself and others, then the skillful is this bodily action entailing pleasure and producing happiness and such a bodily action you should perform. Exhorting the Samanera use reflection during and after one's actions, the Buddha then said, while you are doing an action with the body, of that particular action, should you reflect? Now, is this action that I am doing with my body conducive to my own harm or to the harm of others or to both myself and others? Then unskillful is this bodily action entailing suffering and producing pain. But if when reflecting, you realize now this action I am doing with my body is conducive to my own harm, uh, to the harm of others and to both myself and others, once again, then unskillful is this bodily action entailing suffering and it will produce pain. From such a bodily action, you must desist. If when reflecting, you should realize now this action of mine that I am doing with the body is conducive neither to my own harm, nor to the harm of others, nor to that of both myself or others. And then skillful is this bodily action entailing pleasure and happiness. And such a bodily action, you should do it again and again. Smile, that's a good one. The Buddha adds, if when reflecting, you should realize, now this action that I have done is unskillful and such an action should be confessed. It should be revealed and made manifest to the teacher and to the learned or to your brethren of the holy life, having confessed, you should acquire restraint in the future. This is saying basically you should take your precepts again when you make a mistake, even if it's at work, doesn't matter where you are, driving a car, doesn't matter what's going on and take them again quietly to yourself after you confess to yourself and admit you had done something wrong. The admonition with regard to skillful and unskillful verbal and mental actions was treated in the same way as the bodily action and repeated. Stating that constant reflection was essential for purification, the Buddha ended the discourse as follows. Thus must you train yourself. By constantly reflecting, shall we purify our bodily actions? By constantly reflecting, shall we purify our verbal actions? By constantly reflecting, shall we purify our mental actions? In the Samyutta Nikaya, there is a special chapter where the Buddha explains to Samanera Rahu the transitoriness of nature. And he's basically talking about Anicca. As Venerable Rahula entered the order in his boyhood, the Buddha availed him of every opportunity to advise and guide him on the right path. And the Sutta Nipata, it states what the Buddha repeatedly admonished him with the following stanzas. Give up fivefold sensual pleasures, so sweet and so charming, going forth from home with faith, be one who has put an end to suffering. Seek a remote lodging, secluded and noiseless, be moderate of food, have no attachment to your robes, alms, requisites and lodging. Come not to this world again. Practice restraint 
with regard to the fundamental code and the five senses, the five precepts. And it's the Vinaya code they're basically speaking of for the monks. Cultivate mindfulness as regards the body and be full of dispassionateness. Avoid alluring, lust provoking objects of sense. Develop your one pointed composed mind towards loathsomeness. Means practice the body parts at the minimum in the Satipatthana and also the foulness of the body by the cemetery contemplation if you're strong enough to do that, but that's not the vital one. The vital one is to learn the body parts basically and recite them, especially if lust is arising in any way and you wish to counter that. Think not of the outward appearance of senses, give up latent pride, thus eradic eradicating pride, you shall fare on a perfect peace. And then came his 18th birthday, when the Buddha preached a profound discourse on mind culture and the occasion for it being a sense desire that arose in Venerable Rahula's mind on account of his beautiful appearance. One day, the Venerable Rahula was following the Buddha in quest of alms. And as the Buddha went along, followed by Rahula, it seemed that the pair was like an auspicious royal elephant and his noble offspring, a royal swan with its beauteous signet, a regal lion with its stately cub. Both were golden in complexion, almost equal in beauty, and both were of the warrior caste, both had renounced a throne. Rahula, admiring the teacher, thought, I am as too am handsome like my parent, the exalted one, beautiful in the Buddha's form, and mine is similar. The Buddha instantly read an evil thought and looking back addressed him thus, whatsoever form there be should be regarded thus. This is not mine. This am I not. This is my, not my soul. Rahula submissively inquired of him whether he should regard only form as such. The Buddha replied that he should regard all of the five aggregates, khandas, as such. The venerable Rahula, having been thus edified by the Buddha himself, preferred not to enter the village for alms. He turned back and sat at the foot of a tree with his legs crossed and the body held erect, intent on mindfulness. The venerable Sariputta, noting the suggestive position, posture of Rahula Samanera, advised him to concentrate on inhaling and exhaling, not knowing that he was practicing another object of meditation, on the instruction of the Buddha. Venerable Rahula was perplexed because he was given two different objects of meditation, one by the Buddha and the other by his teacher, Sariputta. In obedience to his teacher, he concentrated on breathing, went to the Buddha to get his own instruction on the subject. And as a wise physician would give the needed medicine, ignoring the patient's desires, the Buddha first expanded his brief instruction on meditation, on form and other aggregates, and then briefly enumerated certain subjects of meditation with the specific evil conditions temporarily eliminated by each and then explained the meditation on respiration, the Anapanasati to him. Acting accordingly 
to the Buddha's instructions, Rahula succeeded in his meditations, and before long, hearing the Chula Rahula Wada Sutta, he attained arahatship. The Chula Rahula Wada Sutta is 147 in Majjhima Nikaya. In the 14th year after the enlightenment of the Buddha, Samanera Rahula received his higher ordination. He died at 35, according to some historians. He predeceased the Buddha and the venerable Sariputta. Venerable Rahula was distinguished for his higher standard of discipline. The following four verses are attributed to him in the Taragata. Being fortunate from both sides, they call me Lucky Rahula. I was the son of the Buddha and that of the seer of the truths. Destroyed are all my corruptions. There is no more rebirth to me. An arahant am I worthy of offering possessed of threefold knowledge and a seer of the deathless am I, blinded by sense desires, spread over by a net, covered by a cloak of craving, bound by the kinsmen of heedlessness, was I like a fish caught in the mouth of a funnel net. That sense desire have I burnt, it is removed. The bond of Mara have I cut, eradicating craving from its root. Cool am I, peaceful am I now. So this is where we stop this time and we we'll take some questions next time when we come back, we will talk about Nanda and then Ananda and then we will also talk about Pajipati Gotami. Okay. And and then there will be we'll be moving into another branch of people where there's some situations like with Devadatta and things like that the following week. So next week should be interesting too, but let me open this up now to questions about anything that we talked about uh, concerning what happened with Rahula when he went. He actually was given an inheritance, but not a worldly inheritance. So let's open up for questions. Ooh, quiet, quiet, quiet. <laughs> what do you think of these folks so far? Sarma, what do you think of them? Bhante, are we connected? Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> I never had a silent group like this for a long time. <laughs> you know, what is interesting, um, today, there, without going back into the story more clearly like this, um, there really are some mix-ups on some of the things. Like, calling when he left basically an abandonment of his family and things like that doesn't make any sense because of the house she came from and the house he came from and the number of people that were involved in royal households with multiple parenting going on and all that stuff 
it's not like she was left without support. There was another story. Bunty, who was the, what was the name of the woman whose baby died that time? And she took it to the Buddha to, to, um, you, you know what, you know who I'm talking about? And uh, the woman. I know the story, huh? Hmm? She later became a Arahat nun. Uh, yeah, later she becomes an Arahat, I think. Yeah. But that that story is also not understood in the Western um, world very well. And I guess I was kind of shocked because a lot of people, when I ran into this, a lot of people had their master's Kisa degrees Gautami. in Buddhism. Who was it? Kissa Gotami. Kissa Gotami. Okay. Kissa Gotami, she had a baby, and what happened? The baby died. It was the only child. She was absolutely devastated. And so she wrapped the baby up and went to find the Buddha and said, because you're not, basically when she found her, she said to him, you know, you're a Buddha, you can bring this baby back. So bring this baby back. Buddha is very, very compassionate man. Very, very compassionate. He had to stop for a split second in his case <laughs> to just think of what he should do in this situation might take another person a little longer to figure it out but and what he did was he told her perhaps i can help if you will bring me a mustard seed she looked at him and she said how but this mustard seed must come from a house where no one has ever died now in india that's pretty difficult to have happen and um, she left with the baby and started knocking at doors around the city where she was and went door to door explaining her situation and telling them what she needed, but no one could help her. No one could give her a mustard seed from a house where no one had ever died. She had to come back to the Buddha, but by the time she came back, she was very quiet she realized the baby was deceased. She couldn't find this, but what she did find in that journey of going door to door was Anicca. She deeply, deeply understood Anicca that everything that rises will pass away, that nothing is permanent, that all things that come into being will exist and then pass away. And we don't know when. And this is what happened. It was a profound truth for her. She took the baby into the forest and buried, the for buried it outside of the city. And then she came back and started to listen to the Buddha further. She lady becomes a nun and she goes all the way to Raha Arashat ship. So these are opening experiences, what happens, the devastations that sometimes we run into in our life that feel like they literally are just pushing us down out of life, out of existence. When we turn around, we see lessons within them, the things that we go through, the things making an assumption that in for instance, even in a relationship, what happens in the beginning will continue exactly the same way in the middle and go to the end. Profound lesson never happens, never. Because things are always changing. And it doesn't mean that you would lose the relationship, but if you cannot bend in the wind, then you will break and fall away from the relationship. This is what happens to people so much in the West, yeah. Not having the patience to bend with the wind and like the grass blows and it comes back and blows and comes back. There's so much in nature that we can listen to, which gives us the keys to these relationships that happen to us along the way. Sarma, what's up, Sarma? Yeah. 
tell me please just now i joined i went away for some urgent work please tell me mata ji i'm sorry tell you what just i went away and uh, came back now we just talked about kissimi godama who had the baby yes and the baby died yeah kissa godama uh, she was uh, rahant she did turn come uh, master seed she has, she has to bring from a family where uh, death is not uh, occurred earlier no death opinion. ever occurred that's uh, right so she couldn't find it uh, that's what our uh, goenka ji used to tell that particular story <laughs> but the lesson is significant because he gave her the opportunity by sending her to find this mm. she would take a long journey to find it and mm. what she would find was anicha she understood mm. anicha when she came back yes. which is the principal Thank point you. here yeah Thank and then you. she knows yeah mm. everything has a beginning has a middle has an end or changes yeah mm. nothing stays still this is the mm. flux of the universe the constant movement and motion of everything mm. yeah so how are you doing sarma okay uh, going on the dif- what is the difference between uh, consciousness in the jhanas and consciousness with uh, in, in daily life could you please explain in daily life uh, the object is uh, we are uh, getting absorbed uh, superficially is known to us but at the same time i am involving myself i can't see any true? difference in consciousness itself consciousness uh-huh. cognizes and understands what's happening okay so consciousness in the jhanas there's a consciousness which is an awareness of what's happening in each one of the jhanas the jhanas are not absorption jhanas they are aware jhanas and awareness is part of consciousness you see you are in a position with the tranquil wisdom insight meditation jhanas are in a position of being aware of what's happening the way sariputta was aware of each thing one um one by one being able to watch things appearing in the jhana this is not possible in an absorption jhana you see so the consciousness is not there the consciousness goes in if you go deep into a absorption jhana you turn off and you're not it's not like turning off in cessation your consciousness goes into trance state and trance state according to neurologists we can't learn anything perceive anything compute anything from that state and so what happened with the absorption path of uh, the jhanas is you have to stop that and come out for as you come out after you're in a deep state you come out then you experience uh, having insights arise it's so different but when you're following sorry putta's path of the training which is what we're doing your awareness is alert and you are able to watch even if you are in nothingness and you're just watching there was a woman i always go back to her in south korea sitting for 4 hours with absolutely not moving at all and just watching and she was always coming in to speak like this in each one of the you know interviews just this much she couldn't speak any louder because she was so calmed out just totally in equanimity but she could still see in the darkness the slightest vibration that moved the slightest movement that arose or shook or anything in the darker state in the deeper states where you're just having mind as the object of meditation you see so that's consciousness consciousness is cognizing that movement under like I always try to describe this state as um as a mountain lake that becomes absolutely still in the evening and you know we used to um canoe on a lake like that but nothing is moving in the water at all and if you stop the canoe and just sit there sometimes you'll see a fish go under the water and there's a slight movement that settles out the top of the lake is just 
completely like glass. There's no movement at all, nothing. You're just staring at the surface until suddenly something just moves and then goes away, see? So consciousness cognizes and cognizing something means you will be able to perception, feeling and consciousness are conjoined. So you, per, you can perceive something and cognize it means name it, you know, the, I'm sorry, perception is naming it, perceiving and naming it. Yeah. Yes. I think there was a little bit uh, pause. Uh, I think uh, you, we lost your connection. Can you repeat what was said last? Oh, okay. When you're sitting there, you're recognizing. We are getting lost. Again, yeah. I think a connection issue. We are not getting. You're not getting me, and it looks uh, like it's working. Losing your connection, huh? Um, connection problem. Maybe that's true here because we've had so many blackouts. Just a second, though. I think, I think this is full. Just a second. Let me see. I don't know if it's the other one. I can switch this. Just a second. Let me switch. Um, Whoops, that's not right. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, I can do it now, just a second. I think I can do it without cutting off, I'm pretty sure. Um, what I mean to say, in jhanas, we get involved deeply with the object of loving kindness or some other thing and develop more uh, and get into deeper level and totally absorb, absorbed is not the correct word, <laughs> observing the things. It is not happening in the day-to-day -day life. That is what I want to convey. I think she got disconnected. She will, uh, she rejoined. You are on mute. There's something. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, yes. 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 You can repeat your question. So what we're talking about is consciousness here. Okay, and when you are in the deeper jhanas. You remember consciousness, feeling, perception, and consciousness are conjoined, right? Mm -hmm. So you have very little feeling going on when you're very, very deep, but you can perceive what's happening. You can actually name what's happening. Sometimes it's just, it's just a slight, tiny movement of vibration, okay? But you're consciously aware when you're in these jhanas, just the way Sariputta was describing things one by one at a time. Okay. And because we're following aware. Yep. Yep. Sarma. We are Can not you hear me? It. No, no, no. We are not getting I don't, I don't know. Should I what should I do, Bonte? Hang up and start again? Actually, just now uh, you got disconnected and came back. Are you using Reliance now, or do you have a bunch of? Things? I'm using Geo now. I'm using Geo, and it should be powerful enough. It's green, blue, and green. So I mean, it should it be. It's working now. I can hear. Uh, I I think. Uh, yeah. We continue, continue. We can okay, continue. so what we're talking about is the form of consciousness that you're using when you are dealing with the jhanas. That's what I heard you question, right? Okay. And so when we're talking about that in Sariputta's form of practice, which is what we're doing, 
we're able to watch things happening one by one as they appear, as they go down, they rise up, they exist, and they go away. The next piece comes in, goes and goes away like that. Okay. So you're conscious and that means you can cognize that. To cognize something is to understand it's happening, to understand it's happening in the experience. And to, to um, perceive is to name it if you choose. When you're in the deeper states, very deep states, like three, four hours of sitting or something like that, you're only perceiving like the slight movement or the little tiny wiggle under the water when you're looking at a lake and it's flat in the evening and it's absolutely still. And then something goes like that under the water and there's a little tiny ripple, you see? That's the only movement that's going on, if anything. And your mind is letting go, relax, smile, come back. It's letting go automatically. It's just letting go. It's never minding anything that you see at all. By the time you're in those states, there shouldn't be any concern at all for anything coming up. The direct order is do not engage anything, meaning don't even, you don't even, no need to even look at anything that's going on. If you saw something immediately, your mind just lets it go, relaxes and comes back, see? Okay, you understand? Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Sadhu, Sadhu. Yeah. The, the teaching of the Buddha, the Buddha that I think is interesting is that um, uh, it is a process of um, relinquishment, a process of uh, letting go and elimination of letting go, but no forceful doing anything. So originally, I don't know where the expression came from, effortless effort, but actually the Buddha is ordering you to have an effort, an effortless effort. So from my, I don't know what they describe that as when they talk about it. I've read a couple things about it, but it still sounded to me they were trying to do something. And the Buddha is actually saying, just be a watcher. Just be a witness. Don't do anything, nothing. Okay. So if you buy into what his direct his direct um, order to you was regarding anything that arises at all from the training. If you do it from the early time, you take my word for it and you just do that. You just don't pay any attention to anything that comes up. Past, present, future, nothing that comes up. And simply start six R-ing, six R-ing. It becomes a line of relinquishment, a line of abandonment, a line of dissolution the untangling of everything and the gradual breaking down until you get to no tension, no tightness, no concern until you're not there. It's about the idea of you, even the pressure of you thinking about something is going to disappear. And then you're just, nothing is happening. So this is the effortless effort. Now, effort is a catch word on the one hand when we go and look at the definitions of effort we see things like uh, the description and striving what, what i did sometimes was somebody thought said uh, disagreed about right effort how we handle it is we go in here and we pull out the statement um, in one of the chapter one of the suttas like in 77 you go in and look at the paragraph we're dealing with and they just didn't understand what we could possibly mean when we were saying the six R's. But I had to look at why they were stuck, why they couldn't understand. So it is kind of twisty and turning. Most parts of Buddhism are twisty and turny if you don't have all of the pieces of the puzzle fit together, see? The problem we have in Buddhism was the cubby holding, the the putting the pieces in individual pub cubby holes and not realizing we were dealing with a weaving with a tapestry and they were all parts of the threads that made the Buddha Dhamma cloth, you see. So when it's a cloth, you can't just pull a thread out of a cloth 
think of it this way. I mean, here, let me show you something right now. Wait a minute. I have something right back here. Just a second. And if I pull this out, right, if I can get to it. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay. Say, so if I were to explain to you what this is, okay, what this is, this, this weaving, okay? And this is very important, this weaving in, in the <coughs> culture that it came from. But if I was trying to explain to you this weaving, would I be able to explain this incredible weaving to you if I just pulled one string out and we started to talk about it? Do you think so? Do you think so? No. I can't, can I? So I have to be able to explain what this part means, what this part means, what this part means, and that this pattern here is the signature of the daughter of the head weaver of the village, the head weaver. And the bottom designates how she is, how, she, how, many, how much time she's been weaving and what she's been doing. So if we look at that and we say, that's the Dhamma cloth. If I pull out this energy thread, can mm. I explain energy? Or if I just took concentration out and tried to explain it to you, would I be able to do that to explain it? I don't think so. I think the only way to explain it is when you put it all together, then you can start talking about how they interweave and they are supporting each other to actually make this cloth, you see? So that's what we're up against. With this. So listen to why you got in trouble. Okay, you get in trouble. I have proclaimed to my disciples the way to develop the four right kinds of striving. Okay, uh, and striving is basically right effort, but it's done automatically and all the time. Here, among awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of unarisen evil unwholesome states. Well, that sounds like he tries to stop the arising of evil, unwholesome states. So that sounds like work to me. Sounds like energy I have to put into making something not arrive anymore. Then it says... Energy is, um, Mataji, energy is nothing but our hem of the cloth. I'm well, in, in one sense, that's true, but there's energy uh -huh. that runs your, there's energy we can go. Without, into, without him, without him, you cannot call it as a cloth. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here he says, he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. Now, these words, they sound like they take a lot of strength, don't they? Makes effort arouses energy, exerts mind, and strives. So it sounds like this is something that's pressure that is hard to do. The question is, you, go, you have to look at all the things you learn in, in Buddhism. And um, do you remember I told you the story of two armies were on two opposite mountains, and they were going to go down in a valley, and they were going to have a big battle. Now, they could have a battle to fight over the valley and whoever won owned it, okay? Or if they didn't want to have a fight, they could think of another way of not having everybody die on both sides when it's time to do the planting season or the harvesting of the food. How could they do that? So if we go to Sun Tzu and we look at Sun Tzu in the art of war, and he was a... Um, he was a, uh, how do you say, it was a, per, a peer of the Buddha's time. And quite possibly, they knew about each other's teaching. In the art of war, and it's stating, basically, to defeat an army does not mean you have to go down there and just cut everybody up and have a huge battle. It could mean that you send a spy down to figure out where the supply route is coming from and then you go and destroy the, the supply route and the other army has to go home. Do you see that? We didn't even fire a gun. We didn't even shoot a missile. We didn't do anything. We just fixed it so the other army could not exist and stopped the whole thing. See? 
Now, what he did was really smart. And he had the person had to figure out that an army cannot exist without its food for its troops. And once that's cut off, they have to leave. They have to go and find food. There's no other way out of this, you know. And so when I look at this and I see those words that are indicating powerful action, I suppose that's how this all happened, where it came to be believed you had to destroy, annihilate, eradicate, suffocate, subdue, do, press down and destroy a hindrance. But the fact is, if you had enough knowledge, like this knowledge about get rid of the supply road and you don't have to have a war, if you understand how a hindrance operates, and your per you find that your personal attention to the hindrance is what is the is the nutriment for the hindrance, then you just withdraw the food and you don't have hindrances anymore. And this is a fact. We go through 11 different suttas that I teach you in the Majima Nikaya regarding the, the uh, hindrances. And all 11, nine or 11 of those uh, suttas that I use for that are showing you that abandonment was his directive, abandonment. Now he said in 22, he said, uh, an obstacle cannot become an obstruction unless you engage it. Yes, I am responsible. Okay. okay. So what does it mean to engage? Somebody said, oh, what does it mean to engage? There's always going to be somebody ask that question. Does it mean I just look at it? Does it mean I name it? Do I, does it mean I move over there and say, well, why are you here? Where did you come from? <laughs> How much is engaging? What does that all mean? But at the bottom of each sutta, no matter how they say it, like in one of them, there's seven ways to handle a sutta, but it doesn't just tell you those seven ways and say, work really hard. I think it's, um, let's see, it's number two, the Sabasava Sutta. If you go to Sabasava Sutta, what you're actually looking at is you're looking at seven ways to handle a sutta. But when we look at the summary of, at the end, the conclusion of the last page of the sutta, it says, so when for, when for a bhikkhu the taints that should be abandoned by seeing have been abandoned by seeing. So he's talking about abandonment. The whole thing is abandonment. You see them, you abandon them. See? Abandoned by restraining, abandoned, 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 abandoned. But abandon is the key word. Abandon. If you go to 128, the whole thing's about abandonment. How smart can you be about abandoning a hindrance? You go to Samyutta Nikaya, you read precisely how they work. So on page 1597 of the, of the uh, Samyutta Nikaya in the Bojanga Samyutta, you listen very carefully to how it works. And they work only because you give them nutriment and feed them. It's the bottom line of everything. Nice. So by the time you're into anywhere beyond the second John or third John, you're going to become begin to see this is real and let go and let go. By the time you're in infinite space, we go in and out in our practice. If you pay attention to a sutta, you're gone out of the out of the out of the jhana. If you have moved over to find out who it is, you just left the jhana. Every time you go over there, so you can't say while I was in the jhana. Let's, you can't say this to me. I sat for an hour, and I was only able to stay on my object of meditation for three minutes, two or three minutes. And I'm thinking, what happened here? One hour of sitting, but only two minutes on the object of meditation before you're pulled away. 
And see, that's a bad figure, isn't it? Because that means for about maybe could be as many as third, well, 20 times anyway, that you're doing this, going off, coming back, going off, coming back, going off, coming back. Every time you leave, you, you ended your meditation in the jhana. You see, this is the real reality of this thing. So if a person were to move over to a hindrance and decide to stay with it until it went away, that's my favorite one. I had to move over to stay with it until it went away. Then I could come back. Well, my question is then why did you do two practices? What do you mean they say? Well, the first practice was with your object of meditation, but then when you moved over there to stay until it went away, then that is called an investigative meditation practice about the hindrances that you're in do now. And then if it doesn't we're not uh, we're not against that okay this is kind of interesting so we will say can i do the closing i think yeah, yeah. sarma are you frozen you're there <laughs> okay. yes okay let's let's do this then okay so that's the way that goes if you learn how the hindrance works and you believe that, that you've discovered it then pay attention and just don't go over there anymore just never mind everything nothing matters there's nothing that matters and that's how you go very fast down the path and go back to the level where you can go into cessation okay thank you thank you thank you okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Have a great week.